Welcome to another episode of Too Close to Home, the series where we dig up creepy stories, haunted places, and mysteries from our very own Patreon's hometowns. This episode we're looking at Joshua, Dave, Will, Ali, and Emilo's hometowns, and do we have some good stories in store for you five? If you want us to dig up stories from your area, head on over to Patreon and join our Too Close to Home tier. Thank you everyone for supporting us, and now, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Joshua Seeley, Altoona, Pennsylvania. Altoona is a city in Blair County, Pennsylvania, and is the home of our patron Joshua. Now we know Joshua has not long celebrated his 40th birthday, and the Top 5's team would like to send our congratulations. For you, Joshua, we'll look at two places in your hometown with disturbing pasts. We'll start with the Baker Mansion. The Baker Mansion is a Greek Revival-style house, built between 1844 and 1848 for prominent local ironmaster Elias Baker, who lived there for many years with his family. Today, the 28-bed house is the Blair County Historical Society headquarters and museum, and in 1975 the building was added to the National Register of Historic Places. However, for many years, it has had the dubious reputation as being the most haunted building in Altoona. The most prominent ghost is that of Elias' daughter, Anna. Legend says that Anna fell in love with one of her father's workers, and the young man proposed marriage. But when the happy couple shared the news with Elias, he flew into a rage. He thought the man was not worthy of his daughter, as he was poor and of a lower class. So he drove the man away, leaving Anna heartbroken. Anna told her father if she couldn't marry the man she loved, she would remain a spinster for the rest of her life. And true to her word, Anna remained alone and unmarried until her death in 1914. Her spirit is said to linger in the house and has a particular attachment to an antique wedding dress that was once displayed in one of the bedrooms. The dress did not belong to Anna as she never got to choose her dress, but it was worn by family friend Elizabeth Bell, the daughter of another wealthy ironmaster. The dress is no longer on display as its delicate fabric was deteriorating, in part because the dress was constantly being disturbed by an unseen force. Despite being in a glass case, the skirts of the gown were often seen moving, as if someone was pulling on them. Other times, witnesses saw the dress rocking violently in its case, shaking so badly it was feared the glass would crack. It has always been believed that Anna's ghost is responsible for these outbursts, angry at the presence of a wedding dress she never got the chance to wear. Another ghost said to haunt the house is Anna's brother David, who was once a crew member on a steamboat. In 1852, David was killed in a steamboat accident, but because it was winter time, the ground was too frozen to bury him, so his body was stored in the cellar of the Baker Mansion until the spring thaw. To this day, visitors have reported hearing screams coming from the cellar, whilst others have witnessed the full-bodied apparition of a man dressed in uniform, lurking in the shadows, along with an older lady dressed in black, believed to be Elias' wife, Hetty. In fact, Elias himself has also been known to make his presence felt in the dining room area. It seems the whole family remain in the house, as Anna's brother, Sylvester, is also said to haunt the parlour where he died of a heart attack. Allegedly, he got up from the sofa one evening to go to bed and collapsed on the floor dead pressure pads under the carpet, where he fell, that are now part of a security system, are randomly activated when no one is in the area. We wonder, Joshua, if you've ever visited the place, and if so, we'd love to hear about your experience. Lastly for you, Joshua, we'll cover the story of Betty Sean Jade. On Tuesday, May 29th, 1979, 22-year-old Betty Jean Jade left her babysitting job on First Avenue in Altoona at around 10 p.m and proceeded to walk home to the apartment she shared with her boyfriend Charles Soult on 1410 4th Street, but she never made it. A week later, a hiker was heading to Wapsonanoc Mountain when he stumbled across what he thought was a body. He called Logan Township Police and met two officers at the Buckhorn Inn, from where he led them to the site. The officers confirmed he had, in fact, found a body. It was a gruesome sight. The young woman had been left in a pile of trash, The mutilated corpse was later identified as Betty. Friends described former Altoona High School student Betty as a very sweet, innocent girl who was quiet and polite. 
She loved to sew and embroider items to give as gifts, and no one could believe what had happened to her. One overriding opinion was that they couldn't understand how she'd ended up in a relationship with Charles Soult. Almost immediately, Charles was a suspect, but there wasn't enough evidence to arrest him. So in a move that was unusual in 1979, investigators turned to the fledgling FBI efforts of psychological profiling. The profile indicated the killer was a thin white male between the ages of 17 to 25, who was an introverted loner from a dysfunctional family who was probably into pornography and who knew the victim well. These and many other pieces of the profile fitted Charles Soult. However, the one defining observation was that the killer would return to the scene and visit the victim's grave. It was known that Betty was killed somewhere else before being dumped at the waste site and her body had been mutilated post-mortem. Charles Soult, who worked for a local waste hauling company, his sister Kathy, who was a good friend of Betty, and their brother Michael were all put under 24-hour surveillance. Eventually, both Michael and Kathy came forward and confessed what happened that night. All three of them picked Betty up in Kathy's car. Charles was upset because Betty was going to leave him. The group drove to an area off Wapsononok Mountain Road, near an old railway bed where the killing occurred. Days later, Charles wanted to return to the scene and remove the body. It was then taken to the dump site. Charles was later convicted of Betty's murder, but avoided the death sentence. It was determined Kathy and Michael did not participate in the murder. Charles was sentenced to life and is still incarcerated at the State Correctional Institution at Huntingdon. Many years later, the case was fictionally depicted in the Netflix show Mindhunter. Although those involved in the real case were unhappy that the presentation blurs the real facts about what occurred. They also use aliases, with Betty Jean called Beverly and Charles renamed Benjamin. Dave from Charlton, Greenwich, London. Charlton is one of the oldest settlements in London and is home to one of the engineering marvels of the world, the Thames Barrier. It is also the place Dave, our patron, calls home. For you, Dave, we have two fascinating tales from the past. We'll start with the Charlton House Ghosts. Charlton House in Greenwich was built in the 1600s for Sir Adam Newton, who was Henry, Prince of Wales' tutor. Today, it is one of the finest surviving Jacobean mansions in England. It is also one of the most haunted. Over the years, the Grand House has seen many occupants come and go and it's no surprise that a few of them drew their final breath within its walls. Many people have reported considerable paranormal activity in the building, and the attic and the cellars are said to be particularly creepy and oppressive. However, the most terrifying is that of the presence of a grey lady, whose apparition has been seen witness on several occasions, always carrying a bundle with what looks like a baby snuggled inside. It is rumoured that during renovations, the body of a baby was found within an old fireplace, and it's claimed the Grey Lady was the child's mother, and haunts the house, still desperately clinging to her stillborn child. Another ghost said to haunt the house is that of Sir William Langhorne, who lived there in the late 1600s until his death in 1714. Sir William was desperate for a son and heir, but sadly died childless, and his fortune passed to his nephew. His disgruntled apparition has been spotted in the rooms and halls of the building. In 2021, during a ghost hunt at the mansion, a member of the public caught this image in the part of the house, known as the Minstrel's Gallery. It's thought this could be the ghost of the long-dead Sir William Langhorne. What do you think, Dave? Next up, we have the Greenwich Pie Shop with a grisly past. Today, Goddard's at Greenwich is a traditional pie and mash shop, but few realize as they tuck into their meal that the building was once the site of a grisly murder. In the early 1800s, not long after the Napoleonic Wars had finished, 78-year-old John Smith, a former sailor, became a Greenwich pensioner, the naval equivalent of a Chelsea pensioner, and resided at the Royal Hospital Greenwich. John was a strong, vigorous man for his age, who still had an eye for the ladies. After a visit to a brothel, Old Jack, as he was known, met an aging floozy named Catherine Jones. Soon after, Old Jack got her a job at the hospital, and she became known as Jack Smith's wife. However, 18 months into their relationship, Catherine started seeing a younger and more attractive pensioner. 
Jack was furious, and on the 4th of October, 1822, he went to the cricketer's public house in central Greenwich, now the pie shop, looking for Catherine. The barman said he had seen her, so old Jack hung around the bar and waited for her, swigging from a jug of ale and clutching a sharp knife in his pocket. Soon the brazen Catherine came sauntering into the pub with her new love, completely ignoring old Jack and ordering two glasses of gin with peppermint. An outraged Jack sneaked behind Catherine and stabbed her, saying, you have killed me, you have killed me. Poor Catherine screamed and ran out of the pub towards the infirmary nearby, but she only got 40 paces before dropping dead. Jack was arrested, and at his trial, he told the court about his wife's unsatisfactory behavior. He said he challenged her when she ignored him in the pub, and her only response had been to put her foot down hard on one of his corns. So he stabbed her in a fit of anger, and he hoped the court would show him mercy. However, they didn't, and Jack was found guilty and sentenced to hang. Awaiting execution, Jack wrote his own Ballad of Maidstone Jail, a poem, though so good, that it was published in the Morning Chronicle and the Newsgate Calendar. Here is that poem. In the county of Wicklow I was born, but now in Maidstone die in scorn. I once was counted a roving blade, but to my misfortune had no trade. Women was always my downfall, but still I liked and loved them all. A hundred I have had in my time, when I was young and in my prime. Women was always my delight, but when I got old they did me slight. A woman from London to me came, she said with you I would fain remain. If you will be my constant I'll be true, I never want no man but you. And on her own Bible or oath did take, that she never would me forsake. And during the time that I had life, she would always prove a loving wife. And by that means we did agree, to live together she and me. But soon her vows and oath did break, and to another man did take. When she'd fetched home with her to lay, and that proved her own destiny. So as Jack Smith lay on his bed, this notion strongly run in his head. Then he got up with that intent, to find her out was fully bent. Swearing if he found out her oath, she'd broke he stick a knife into her throat. Then to the cricketers he did go, to see if he could find it out or no. Not long been there before she come in, with this same fellow to fetch some gin. Then with a knife himself brought in, immediately stabbed her under the chin, and in five minutes she was no more, but there laid in her purple gore. Now to conclude and end my song, they are both dead, dead and gone. They are both done, I do declare, Gone, they are, but God knows where. However, despite public sympathy, Old Jack was executed at Maidstone Jail on December 23rd. Before his death, he remarked that women had always been his downfall. The Cricketers Pub at Greenwich lived on for many years after Jack Smith's death and was still operating as a pub until 2004. Today, Greenwich's oldest murder pub is the Goddards of Greenwich Restaurant at what is today 22 King William Walk. However, it's said the spectres of both Jack and Catherine still haunt the former pub, where in effect, they both lost their lives. Will Surratt, Worcester, Massachusetts. Will lives in Worcester, Massachusetts. His hometown is named after a place in the UK, also called Worcester. As requested, we will first look at the Turtle Boy, followed by a rather creepy cemetery. Let's start with the Turtle Boy. In 1904, Harriet Burnside died, and in her will, she left $5,000 to the city of Worcester to finance a commemorative memorial fountain for her father. Charles Y. Harvey was chosen to design the sculpt piece, and he began work on what he named Boy with Turtle at his studio in New York City thinking it would be his masterpiece. But almost immediately, Harvey had reservations about his design and felt it was not good enough. This was a trait the troubled artist had displayed in the past. Around a week after beginning the work, Harvey started hearing voices coming from the partially carved sculpture, demanding that he kill himself. Soon after, on Saturday, January 27th, 1912, Harvey took his own life. His body was found in Bronx Park, New York, with his throat slit and two straight razors nearby. It was apparent his gruesome death was by his own hands. 
After his death, the sculpture was completed in line with Harvey's design by Sherry Fry. The fountain, originally intended to provide water for humans, dogs and carriage horses, was unveiled in 1912 during a low-key ceremony in Central Square, Worcester. But after it saw little use, it was moved in 1969 to Worcester Common and turned to face Salem Square. One year later, the statue was ripped from its pedestal and stolen. It was returned later that same year, but it took until 1972 for the boy and turtle to be placed back on top of the basin. The statue has caused controversy over the years and has a love-hate relationship with the locals. Its main point of contention is its design. It's impossible to view the sculpture without questioning the claim that it represents a boy riding a turtle. The boy's determined gaze and the turtle's strained expression suggest a more bestial interpretation. What Harvey's original intentions were for the design of the Burnside Fountain are unknown, but today, Turtle Boy has been accepted, reluctantly by some, as Worcester's unofficial mascot. Let's take a look at Spider Gate Cemetery. Friends Cemetery was founded back in 1740. It's a small, private Quaker cemetery in secluded woodland just outside of Worcester. It is dubbed Spider Gate Cemetery due to its black wrought iron gates that some say look like spiderwebs, but are actually an art deco representation of sun rays. However, it's not just the gates that aren't what they seem. The cemetery is known for some pretty extreme stories. It's believed that besides the main entrance, Spider Gates has seven other invisible entrances, and once you unknowingly pass through all seven, the eighth will lead them into hell, and many believe Spider Gate is the eighth. If you survive walking through the gates, look out for an eight foot tall gatekeeper who guards the cemetery. If he believes you're up to no good, he will lock the spider gates behind you, and you'll be forced to climb over a stone wall to get out. To the left of the gate is a large oak tree where some visitors have witnessed a noose hanging. Next to the oak is a raised barren area with no sign of anything growing. This spot is known as the altar. There is a granite post in each corner but there are no graves. This was formerly the location of the old Quaker meeting house. However, now it is rumored to be the location of many rituals and satanic sacrifices, where mediums and satanists try to contact the spirits whose bodies are buried in the graveyard. Further into the cemetery, there is a grave with coins on it. This is the grave of Marmaduke Earl, whose spirit allegedly talks from within its resting place. The coins are symbolically left there, as his grave is known as the payphone of the cemetery. Allegedly, if you walk around his grave and say his name ten times, and go to his gravestone, he will talk to you. If you leave no coins, he will tell you to leave. Towards the back of the cemetery, the sound of water can be heard coming from a small stream flowing on the other side of the stone wall. This stream, however, is not what it appears to be. It is rumoured to be the actual River Styx, in Greek mythology, said to be one of the rivers of the underworld. If that wasn't enough, and visitors managed to get out unscathed, the spirits within the graveyard may have drained your car battery. Ali, Singapore Singapore has everything. A convenient location, warm climate, stunning scenery, and top-class cuisine, and is known to be one of the cleanest places in the world and our patron Ali is lucky enough to live there. What we have found though, is it doesn't seem to have many ghosts. Although we have managed to track down a couple at the National Museum of Singapore. The National Museum of Singapore is the nation's oldest museum, dating back to when it was first established in 1849. After several relocations over the next few decades, the museum moved to its current permanent site at Stamford Road. The stunning building on Stamford Road was built in 1882 and was first opened as the Raffles Library and Museum in 1887. Over the years, the museum went through a couple of name changes, but since redevelopment in the early 2000s, it has been known as the National Museum of Singapore. However, the building has been plagued by paranormal activity for many years. It was apparently built on land previously occupied by a monastery known for dealing with exorcisms and several sightings of priest-like figures have been witnessed in the museum. 
The area around a 33-step wrought iron spiral staircase is said to be the spookiest part of the building, where visitors and staff have been stopped forcefully from climbing the stairs or tripped by an unseen force. There is an uneasy feeling in the area and a sense of a strong and forceful presence that does not wish to be disturbed. The notorious spiral staircase seemingly holds many dark secrets. It is said to be built during the pre-war days and houses many horrific war stories of our past. Today the staircase, leading to the rooftop, is inaccessible to the public, but still gives off an unwelcoming, chilly atmosphere. Another ghost said to haunt the building is the former museum director, British doctor and zoologist, Carl Alexander Gibson Hill. Gibson Hill was a diabetic and heavy smoker who suffered poor health in his latter years, and was rumoured to have committed suicide in 1963. People, as well as the museum staff, have reportedly encountered his wandering spirit in the museum. We wonder if you've ever visited this place, Ali, and if so, we'd love to hear if you had any experiences there. The Curry Murder Ayakono Maramuthi lived near Orchard Road Presbyterian Church in Singapore and was the victim of one of the most unusual and bizarre murder cases ever. On January 1987, Detective G. Alagamalia received details from an informant that Ayakono had been murdered, cut into pieces and cooked in curry. Alagamalia launched an immediate investigation and discovered that 34-year-old Ayakono Maramuthi had been reported missing in December 1984 by his wife at the Juchiat police station. She stated that her husband had gone to Genting Highlands to try his hand at gambling and she hadn't heard from him since. Further investigations led to the arrest of eight suspects, including Maramuthu's mother, his wife, and her three brothers and their wives. Details of the gruesome murder were soon divulged by one of the suspects, who told police that on the 12th of December 1984, Maramuthu was taken to Orchard Presbyterian Church, where he was beaten to death and then chopped up into small pieces by one of the other suspects, who was a butcher at a mutton stall. The remains of Maramuthu were then cooked with rice and various spices in a large cooking pot before being emptied into black bins and disposed of in various roadside bins. Six of the eight suspects were charged. However, despite the details of the murder, all six were acquitted and released due to insufficient evidence. Neither the curried remains, the murder weapon, or the cooking pot were ever found. Later, three of Maramuth's wives, brothers, were convicted under the Criminal Law Act and detained in Changi Prison for four years before being released. Emilio Estrada, Saginaw, Michigan Saginaw, Michigan, the name of the city originated from the land of the Sox, after the Native Americans who originally inhabited the area and were called Sox. It is also the birthplace of Stevie Wonder and Serena Williams, and the hometown of our value patron, Emilio. For you, Emilio, we are looking at a haunted house and the grisly past of a now empty patch of land. Let's first take a look at the horror at former Saginaw House. The 1953 wood-framed three-bedroom house that once stood at 535S 23rd in Saginaw looked ordinary enough. However, looks are deceiving because within the walls of this tiny house, three tragic murders occurred. In 1965, Joyce Crandall, a lifelong Saginaw resident, moved into the home with her husband and two sons. Joyce lived there for 25 years, the last eight as a widow. As she got older, she suffered from emphysema and arthritis, but refused to move away from the home she loved. On June 10th, 1990, a Meals on Wheels volunteer delivering Joyce's food found her door unlocked, and after entering the house, she found Joyce slumped in a recliner chair. She had suffered multiple bullet wounds, several stab wounds, and a fractured arm. The autopsy later determined the frail, defenseless old lady had bled to death from the bullet wounds to her chest and back. The savage, senseless murder shocked the community. A year later, 25-year-old Timothy Grandison was arrested for the murder after he confessed. The sad thing was Grandison knew Joyce well and had done odd jobs for her over an eight-year period, and he was one of the few people Joyce trusted and allowed into her house. He also knew where she kept her money. 
His motive was robbery, although the force used to rob an innocent old lady was shocking. Thankfully, Grandison remains in the Signal Correctional Facility in Freeland, where he is serving a life sentence. After Joyce's death, the property was lived in by Barnal Amos. On September 19, 2009, Sharon Elliott dropped her nine-year-old son Devlin off at Barnell's house. He was a family friend and special uncle to Devlin. Devlin was due to stay over with Barnell and his partner, Lavora Santos. However, sometime after 4 a.m., when all three were asleep, intruders entered the home and shot all three occupants as they slept. Devlin died at around 4.40 a.m., and Barnell succumbed to his injuries the next day. Lavora was the only survivor. Police called the crimes a heinous act of violence. For many years, the home sat empty, with a leaflet on the door asking for tips to the unsolved murders. For a short time, the house was put up for sale, with potential buyers having no idea what occurred there. However, ultimately, the executors of Barnell's estate requested a demolition permit in late 2001, and the house was demolished. Today, there's an empty space where the small home at 535 S23rd in Saginaw once stood, and few would be aware of the horrors that happened there. Lastly, we have the Dice Road and the Haunted House. Dice Road crosses a rural section of Michigan between Saginaw and Midland, and is the location of some strange happenings back in 1974. A man named Harold Pomerning lived in a house he built along the Dice, and for months he was terrorised by loud pounding noises inside and outside his home, and unexplained fires. Things got so bad, he contacted the Saginaw County Sheriff's Office. However, after extensive investigation, they couldn't find out what was going on. But despite not finding any physical evidence, retired sergeant of the Saginaw Sheriff's Department, Charles Frisbee, has talked about his time investigating the house. Frisbee claims that Dice Road is strange, and he said in the house he heard noises and experienced what Harold was experiencing, and although he can't explain it, he swears it was happening. For many years, the incident was forgotten, but when filmmaker Stephen Prozac Shippey heard about the occurrences, he decided to make a movie about Dice Road, as the seventh installment in his Haunted Saginaw series. During his research, he discovered a binder full of police reports about the home, and he talked to former officers who worked on the investigation, he also visited the home himself. With the release of the film, there was renewed interest in the paranormal activity along Dice Road, and other residents started sharing their stories. Some recalled seeing strange orbs in the cemetery near the haunted house. Others said they would not go near there at night, as it is plain creepy. Apparently, the apparition of a woman has been seen several times coming out of the Dice Road Cemetery at odd hours of the night, and it's theorized she could be the source of the strange occurrences. Filmmaker Shippy said that the Pomeranian house may have been cursed after Harold had a dispute with a neighbour believed to be a witch. The current owners of the house, Dave and Lewin Larson, have lived there for more than 40 years and have experienced some strange happenings over the years, like an antique radio making noise when it wasn't plugged in, an object being mysteriously moved. Their friends refuse to visit because of the home's reputation, although they do not believe it is haunted. However, their two daughters have a different tale of a time when they were teenagers and home alone whilst their parents went out to dinner. They were sitting in the main living room when they saw a flash outside. Their dog started barking and jumping up in the window. When the girls followed him and looked out of the window, they saw what looked like a man's face pressing against the outside of the glass. His face was white and appeared to be glowing. The terrified girls called their neighbour who came to check it out, but there was nothing no footprints in the snow, or anything to indicate anyone had been near the window. They never got to the bottom of what they saw, but have never forgotten it. Emilio, we'd love to know if you've ever experienced anything creepy along Dice Road. So that's it for episode 19 of our Too Close to Home series. We hope you enjoyed, and we'd like to say a massive thank you to Joshua, Dave, Will, Ali, and Emilio. We hope you enjoyed these stories we dug up from your hometowns. Now, if you want your hometown featured in an episode of Too Close to Home, head on over to Patreon for more information. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.